This is the ingenious ACW536, one of the first Wi-Fi 7 access points to enter the market and it's also one of the few to support some of the most expected features of the new standard out of the box. I am primarily talking about the multi-link operation, a feature which Ubiquiti promises to add at a later date. And we also get support for the 320 MHz channel bandwidth, which will work wonders with the 6 GHz radio band. There's also support for the multi-resource units puncturing, as well as for the 4096 QAM. Additionally, the ingenious ACW536 does have two 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, and yes, they are multi-gigabit. As expected, to use power over Ethernet, you do need a robust switch that supports PoE++. But besides the new Wi-Fi 7 features, the ingenious ACW536 can be managed and monitored using the cloud-based platform, and yes, most of the security features that could be found on the access points from the previous generations are still present here as well. That being said, let's put the ingenious ACW536 access point to the test. The ingenious ACW336 was probably the most compact Wi-Fi 6E access point when it was released, and it seems that the same designers stood behind the development of the ingenious ACW536, since, despite being one of the most powerful access points on the market, at least at the moment, it's still fairly slim and with a pleasant design. And in a similar fashion to the aforementioned ACW336 and the slightly older ACW230S, the top side is made of plastic but the rear panel is metallic. Its role is to help dissipate the heat from the main components, but we will see more in the teardown section. To show the status of the device, the network and everything that pertains to them, there's just a single tiny LED position on the corner. Not really a fan of this approach since I do prefer the good old array of LEDs, but Ingenius has tried to win me over by using RGB. Moving to the port section, we can see the 10 gigabit Ethernet LAN port, which sits next to the 10 gigabit PoE++ LAN port and yes, both are multi-gigabit, so it is possible to go for 5 gigabit, 2.5 gigabit, 1 gigabit and below connections. It's great that we see 10 gigabit access points on the market already and it's a shame that Ubiquiti missed its chance with the U7 Pro to do the same. There's also a recessed reset button and a power in connector. In order to see how well a Wi-Fi 7 access point manages to keep the internal temperature in check, I took out a thermal camera and captured the short video. As you can see, the plastic top is way cooler than the metallic bottom part and it makes sense considering that its role is to take the heat away from the internal components and push it out. And it can get warm to slightly hot depending on the amount of work that the ECW536 needs to do. I did an entire separate video of the step-by-step -step teardown of the ingenious ECW536 and it's not really a difficult process. It's easy to access the main components and either fix anything that's needed or just blow away any accumulated dust. Just be aware that the warranty can be voided depending on the state you're in. You can pause at any time to see the individual components. I have also added a comparison table with other ingenious access points. The ingenious ACW536 is a Wi-Fi 7 access point, so there's a lot to talk about here, but also know that the Wi-Fi certified was also introduced last month, so understand that it's going to take quite a bit before all of the promised features will be supported. There is support for the multi-link operation out of the package, but why is this feature that important? It's a way of keeping the latency incredibly low even when demanding type of applications are being run on multiple connected client devices at the same time. Before, a client device could connect to a single Wi-Fi band, but the idea behind the multi-link operation is to make use of multiple radio bands at the same time, therefore transmitting data across more than one channel. Also understand that even if you enable multi-link operation on your radio bands, it doesn't really mean anything if the wireless adapter that's installed in the client device does not support it. And at the moment, there are very few adapters released and just one widely available, the Intel B200. Moving forward, another important feature that's available with Wi-Fi 7 access points is the multi-resource unit puncturing. Its purpose is to reduce the latency, but to better understand it, let's first remember the OFDMA, which by the way, it is fully supported here. The idea behind OFDMA was to use resource units to distribute data across multiple client devices at the same time, so there was no need to wait for one packet of data to be transmitted once. 
but why not have multiple resource units being transmitted at the same time so no unit is left idle? Why not indeed? Because that's exactly what happens with Wi-Fi 7 access points, so more data is transmitted at the same time towards more devices in a far more efficient way. But there is an issue, the dreaded interference. If a portion of an available channel is being held, such as being restricted or blocked in a region, then relying on a granularity of 20 MHz, the channel is punctured, allowing it to be partially used for data transmission. But again, all of these features will be more valuable in the near future when most or all client devices will have Wi-Fi 7 adapters. If you followed my last few reviews of networking hardware, you know that I included a series of multi-client tests on top of the single-client iPerf tests. And the tools that I rely on are the NetHydra and NetBurn developed by Mr. Jim Salter, which you can get yourself from github.com. Why not just post the single client results that everyone in the grandma seems to be posting in their reviews? Because it doesn't really reflect real life performance. I doubt you're going to pay good money to simply connect one PC to a wireless router or access point, so I will try to simulate various types of traffic on multiple client devices and take a note of their behavior. These are the client devices that I use for these tests, and yes, only two are the same but I assume most people will have some diversity in terms of devices, so it's a more realistic scenario. Also, this is a server computer. The first thing that I checked was how the ingenious ECW536 handles the five aforementioned client devices running concurrent simulated 1080p streams, all limited to 1 megabits per second. Only two client devices remained underneath 100 milliseconds the Wi-Fi 7 one and the Wi-Fi 6 client, so all others will offer a less than ideal performance. Lots of buffering, but it does depend on the type of streaming. If it's gaming, this is not good. Otherwise, if the video has time to download the packages a few seconds in advance, it should be passable. Not that being so close to 100 milliseconds is sterile performance either. So despite only shaking the bandwidth a tiny bit, we already see some serious spikes in latency. Let's see if the concurrent 4K streaming is better. It's worth mentioning that I updated the throughput to 35 megabits per second. The good news is that it's not that much different from the 1080p streaming, which I suppose it was to be expected, since I wasn't anywhere close to reaching the maximum available bandwidth. But yes, if you do intend to stream 4K level data, and you need the latency to be below 30 milliseconds, you're going to have to either limit the number of wireless clients or move a few on cable. Then again, if you're streaming Netflix videos, we see the Zima board 832 offering the worst performance, but it does make sense since it's the farthest client device. The rest may see some buffering from time to time, but it is a usable performance. Now let's add some intense browsing in the mix. I tried to simulate how a somewhat lightweight page would behave where multiple resources are loaded very quickly, creating the illusion that it happens at the same time. I used 12 by 128 kilobits of data per loaded page, and to simulate a somewhat realistic behavior, I also included 500 milliseconds of jitter. Yes, it's more realistic, but it does portray a person compulsively watching a page for a few seconds and then moving on to the next one for about half an hour. All that while 4K streaming is running on all 5 client devices. So it's not 10 client devices, but 2 types of traffic simulated on the same machine at the same time. What I saw is that only the MacBook Pro, a Wi-Fi 5 client, managed to at least maintain the latency somewhat stable, although still above the ideal. The Zima board is pretty much unusable for 4K streaming, while all other clients will experience frequent buffering even at the 75% mark, and the intense web browsing did suffer a bit as well. Both Wi-Fi 6 laptops went past one second most of the time, and the other clients were a bit better, even if some did occasionally rise above one second. You can blame it on the CPU so it can be seen as negligible. Perhaps I went a bit overboard with the 4K streaming, so let's go back to 1080p on all clients but keeping the intense browsing as well. Again, the MacBook Pro is the winner, offering the most stable latency and a decent one as well, at least compared to all others which quickly shot above 200 milliseconds. Checking out the intense browsing graph, it seems that the 1080p streaming was sacrificed for a better web navigation experience. Nothing that QoS can solve. I usually stop here, but some users requested more types of traffic, including simulated download, so I changed things a bit. 
Two client devices still ran the simulated 4K streaming, two ran intense browsing, and one was allowed to use however much bandwidth it wanted to continuously download 10 megabytes files. The 4K streaming clients are actually performing very well with a latency below 30 milliseconds for the majority of time. But the MacBook Pro did slowly rise above 100 milliseconds, so it will see some buffering more often than some users would prefer. The intense browsing which also ran on the MacBook Pro essentially failed and so did the Lenovo, so you will navigate the web very, very slowly. What about the download latency? We see values above 400 milliseconds most of the time, so yeah, not great. I mean, it will work, but it's not fantastic by any means. The next test involves two clients that download 10 megabytes files, two intense browsing clients and one streaming 4K. The MacBook Pro client running 4K streaming offers a good performance even if it does have a 5% spike above 100 milliseconds, and I suppose it also handles the intense browsing somewhat decent, although it does go above what can be seen as acceptable for about 10% of the time. The intense browsing traffic simulation using the first Lenovo laptop simply just gave up, and so did the second Lenovo laptop for the download traffic. The Wi-Fi 7 client performed a bit better with the simulated downloaded traffic, not perfect, but better than expected. Moving forward, I ran some tests on only three client devices and the download and the intense browsing traffic were handled decently well, but the 4K streaming could have been better, quickly passing 100 milliseconds, although not by much. Still keeping the three client devices, I switched the 4K streaming with voice over IP. Also, I changed the 10 megabyte file to a 1 megabyte file for the download test and the intense browsing latency quickly spiked above reasonable levels. The download latency stayed at about 100 milliseconds most of the time, which is not great, but not terrible. The voice over IP was the unexpectedly pleasant surprise because it was actually great. The last test should be taken as a fun experiment because at the suggestion of a lunatic, you know who you are, I ran a test where I simulated the download of 100 by 1 megabyte files across 5 devices at the same time continuously. As expected, the latency is all over the place, but I also managed to collapse the network entirely, pushing the ingenious ACW536 offline, requiring a reboot to return to its previous state. So I hope this was enough of a stress test. As for the single client tests, the one that showed the big numbers, I had to rely on four client devices. Besides checking out the throughput based on the distance between the client devices and the access point, I also made sure to check the signal attenuation because, as I mentioned many times before, this is a far better way to allow the users to replicate the results that I get. You can have a different attenuation of 30 feet than me, so how exactly would you know if you will get the same throughput? That's the thing, you can't, unless you take into account the signal attenuation. As I mentioned before, I have had some issues with a Wi-Fi 7 adapter because it refused to go above 1.5 gigabits per second, and the range is also not that impressive. Maybe it's the antennas, but then again, I did try a couple of Intel B200 with the same results. I even used the antennas from a Wi-Fi 6C TP-Link adapter, and nothing has changed. It may be the incomplete compatibility with the PC, or maybe even the ingenious ACW536. I have also added a comparison with the other wireless access points that I tested over the years, as well as a long-term performance graph. It's worth noting the curious up and down pattern which may coincide with the CPU cycles, so it may still be a client device issue, although I haven't been able to figure it out for now. Why didn't I use Multilink operation? I actually did, as you can see in the previous video, but it didn't really make a difference and I think the culprit is the B200. For the 2.4 GHz radio band single client performance, I relied on three client devices. There's the Wi Fi 6 Intel AX200 laptop, the Intel 8265 Wi Fi 5 laptop, and the Pixel 2 XL Wi Fi 5 client device. And these are the results that I got. The ingenious ACW536 does have a standalone graphical interface that you can access with the default credentials before adapting the device to the cloud management platform but it's very basic in terms of status info that it shows and even less impressive in terms of settings. Of course, it's better than nothing, but it does show how dependent the ingenious ACW536 is to the cloud management platform. After logging into the ingenious cloud, the first thing that you need to do is add the device to the organization 
and that can be done by accessing the inventory and license area, then manually adding the serial number. Then assign it to a network and it should appear under Manage Access Points. Here it is possible to see the status info about the access point and you can also override the global settings which are automatically applied at the moment of device adoption. These global settings can be set up from under Configure, Access Point, SSID and or Radio. Under Radio you can configure how each radio will behave, while under SSID you get to actually create the Wi-Fi networks. This includes a security type whether multilink operation will be active on this specific network, the radio or radios which will work under this SSID, the default VLAN, and there's a dynamic client VLAN pooling, although this feature is only available in the Pro package. As expected, not everything is for free, although for now, we do get almost all of the features as part of the basic package. That being said, I understand that the cloud management platform's reason of existence is to offer an easy way for the admins to monitor and configure a network remotely. And I do think that Ingenius is one of the best in its field at accomplishing this task, something that became clear with the dedicated antennas for interference found on the Ingenius ACW230S and the ECW220S, but also due to the diagnostic tools. And yes, we do have access to a few of them on the Ingenious ACW536 as well, although in a very limited fashion since we're on the basic plan. Each session lasts for one minute and you can run some tools under the network activities, check the channel utilization by radio, and there is also the live client section which is reserved for the pro members. What it does is to analyze what each client does in real time. And it's more important than you may think, because it helps understand what causes a certain behavior, be it interference or low throughput, so the administrator can follow if the user adjusts the settings as instructed for the network or client device to perform better. As for the conclusion, being one of the first Wi-Fi 7 access points on the market, the Ingenious ACW536 does have a lot of eyes on it, especially considering that it offers more features than its main competitors. Of course, I wasn't really able to test the 6GHz radio with all its new bells and whistles because the Intel B200 pretty much underperformed, but I suppose this does show that we are at the very beginning of this new Wi-Fi standard. It does need more time to mature and for the market to receive better adapters. That's when a device such as the Ingenious ACW536 can truly shine. That's it for today, thank you for watching and see you next time.